They said it couldn't be done. They said it wouldn't last. White man, black man. America F1. America F1 coming to you straight from San Francisco, California. Sherman Tillman, Michael Lawler. America F1. Welcome to a special episode of America F1, where our special guest, Mercedes AMG, not Patronus, not Patronus. but only fans, racer of the number 43 car, Alex Vogel. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, Alex, tell us about your racing journey. So... 2011, um, a uh, bunch of dads, uh, five of us, uh, all our kids went to the same K through eight school. Uh, one of the dads challenged everybody to a couples karting championship that he was pretty sure he was going to win. Yeah. So we had a trophy made in advance. And, Wait for uh, himself. For himself. And uh, uh, so that trophy is now in my house. Um, uh, it was actually my wife who came through in the last stint uh, and pulled it off for us, but. Uh, that was the start. Wait, you're right. Your wife had better time than you did. Uh, she had a better time than the other guy's wife did. Oh, okay. Which is okay. what it took to get us over the yeah. line. Yeah. Um, and so that was 2011. Uh, we were like, "That's super fun. Let's do some more karting." So me and four other guys did two 14-hour endurance karting events. Wait. You were in a cart for 14 hours? For 14 wait, hours. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Not by yourself. Wait. We, we, we were... You were switching up. Yeah, there were five of us. Um, by the end, the stints were down to 10 minutes, because that's all you could do physically. It was brutal. Yeah, that, that sounds extremely rough. Uh, it, it was extremely rough. We did it two years in a row, and after the second year, we said, we definitely want to keep racing, and we're never getting into go-kart again. Go-karting is crazy. So we moved to the 24 Hours of Lemons. Uh, Wait, a what? 24 Hours of Lemons. Uh, it's I think it's $500 or $1,000 max you can spend on the car outside of safety equipment. Okay. okay. So we took a non-running Porsche 944, raced it in the 24 Hours of Lemons. Um, uh, I think we did four of them. Yeah. And said, all right, we want to do something more real and not quite as comical. You only get passed by a guy with a giraffe head mounted on a Honda Civic uh, two or three times before you're like, this is fun, but it doesn't feel like we're really racing. Yeah. Um, but you do learn a lot about wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing um, uh, because some of those races, there were 85, 90 cars on track, um, just all over the place. Where, where does that take place? Tracks all around the country. You ever heard of this piece? Yeah, it's actually, it happens right here at Sonoma. Did you ever try it? I, I wish I could, but even I can't, I can't even afford a thousand dollars. 24 Hours of Lemons is an amazing gateway drug for racing. Mm. Um, and so we did that for, I think, four years, and um, four of the original five drivers said, we want to go to the next level and actually do real amateur endurance racing. So we started doing the American Endurance Racing Series mm -hmm. in 2019. We did the 2019 season uh, in a uh, again a Porsche and a 944, and then moved up to a Cayman uh, and did that in 2020. And a crazy thing happened on the last race of the season, which is a 14-hour endurance race at New Jersey Motorsports Park. Um, we watched them hand out the national championship to the guys who won it that year. Mm -hmm. And uh, the those guys were running an E30 BMW. And I watched them go across the stage and get their big trophy and cover themselves with champagne. And the four of us said, let's do that next year, which was preposterous because I think we were 29th in the championship in 2020. We came back in 21, we were super serious about our driving uh, in the off season, and we won the American Endurance Racing National Championship in 2021. Um, wow. 
It was unbelievable. Real rags to riches story right Yeah, there. totally. And when that was done, uh, there were some guys we had run against in that series who had moved up to real professional racing. Uh, uh, in particular, a team called Random Vandals uh, that runs BMWs and IMSA. They do here in SRO GT4 America. And those guys had stepped up to actual GT4 racing. And I was like, well, if they can do it, I, I, I want to at least see what that feels like yeah. and see if it's possible. So the way you do that is you do what's called a test. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot like F1. Um, uh, the only difference is it, it's a test both ways. You're seeing whether that's something that you actually want to do, and they're seeing whether that's something you should do. Right, right. And um, I was fully prepared to get out of the car after my test with and decide, I don't want to do that. That's actually way more than I thought. And to have them say, Hey, dude, that was cool and all, but um, thanks, this, but no this is like a real thing, yeah, and you yeah, can't do this. Yeah. Um, and for better or for worse, they said, yeah, you want to do it? Uh, do it. So, uh, it, again, it, this question of, yeah, but how do you actually find a team and do all that? Uh, I went to a guy that I had uh, raced in the amateur side with named Matt Connolly, who would run Daytona, done a ton of racing, and I said, how do I do this? Who do I talk to? And he recommended me to a guy named Eric Birch, mm -hmm. who had a company called the P1 Group that did driver management. And I reached out to Eric and we started talking. And relatively quickly, he was like, this is how this works. Um, and I had done uh, work on the government affairs side for OnlyFans. And I found out that they had sponsored a team in the, uh, the British GT Championship. And so brought Eric into the conversation, got OnlyFans to agree to a sponsorship in the States uh, for GT America, and it was off to the races. Now, you know, Alex, that every grown man's dream is to be sponsored by OnlyFans. <laughs> right. It's definitely, it's definitely <laughs> my dream as well. So. Right. I mean, there's nobody out there that's going, how did this guy get sponsored by OnlyFans? And no one can believe it when I tell him. I'm like... Yeah, we're gonna have Alex Vogel on, and he's sponsored by OnlyFans. They go, wait, what? Like that's the first thing they want to know. Like, how did that happen? And do the girls come in and like lavish you with riches? No. Um, uh, we have a lot. We have had lots of creators come uh, and do content with the cars and do all that, but they're not lavishing lavishing any attention on me. Um, uh, the crazy part was. Um, like I said, I was doing work for OnlyFans corporate and they were in my office one day and a guy who works for me um, was, was in the room and they were noticing there was racing stuff around the office. Mm. And they were like, oh, are you in the car racing? And I said, yeah, yeah. And uh, the guy who works for me said, uh, yeah, you guys should sponsor him. And the OnlyFans person said, well, we actually sponsor a car in the British GT series. And I was like, what? Uh, you do? And yeah. Like, yeah. And it, OnlyFans actually has done a ton of investment in motorsports. They're sponsoring someone in Perry Dakar right now, drag racing, British GT series. And so we put a package together uh, to run the, uh, the Porsche GT3R mm -hmm. um, in uh, GT America, um, which is high level GT racing. And uh, they thought it was a great opportunity, and I was thrilled to get the opportunity to drive for those guys. So, a little backstory is Alex and I went to high school together, and I am so impressed with uh, what he's become as a man. And not only does he do political stuff for people all across the country, but he has a family, he has a wife, and he finds time to race, and he has all these people in his Volvo group that depend on him to lead the way. And it's just a very impressive from knowing a person from high school to seeing them as they are as a man and the journey that they took. And it actually almost brings me to tears to talk about it because it's just very impressive to know what you've become, man. Well, uh, thank you for saying that. Oh. And I, I would actually say um, there's a whole lot of people we went to high school with uh, that when I look at their journey, um, I, I certainly wouldn't have 
seen that coming from you know 1985. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, especially where we came from. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I try and explain to my kids where we grew up and how we grew up, and yeah. they listen. But I, I know they don't understand. They just don't. You can't understand unless you live through something, and uh, it's been super fun. The other question I have for you is not only the OnlyFans, which I think is super impressive, because when you see the car, it has OnlyFans on it, and you know everybody, like everybody, recognizes what OnlyFans is in America, and you really are the first, other than. In America, you're the first person sponsored by OnlyFans. But you're not just sponsored by OnlyFans. Tell us how you went from racing a Porsche to now racing a Mercedes. Like two of the leading motorsport in the whole world. So the, the driver team marketplace in sports car racing, um, whether it's GT3 or GT4, in many ways is very similar to F1, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of the fact that none of us are that talented and no one has that kind of money. Um, so when we finished the season in GT America last year in the Porsche, um, we set about deciding what we're going to do for this season. Only fans renewed for another year. And you want to find a platform that is, um, I, yes, you want the fastest platform, mm -hmm. but that platform at this level, you have to factor in, okay, which, which car from a balance of performance perspective seems to be doing well. Manufacturers introduce new cars and you don't want to be that first year. Um, generally, and you don't want to be the last year because there's no development. Right. And so as we looked at it, and just the reality is um, the, the Mercedes AMG, it, at least to me and a, a lot of other drivers, it, in many ways is an easier car to drive mm -hmm. than the Porsche platform. Um, it was super hard for me psychologically because I've Actually, only raised Porsches. I have a quick question. Um, like what platform do you think is like the best and the worst like currently? I, I don't know if there's a worst. Um, so much of it is tied to experience and driver comfort and what you're used to. Uh, in my case, I had only ever driven Porsches. Um, like I, Caymans, 911s, and then ultimately, I, so I drove the Cup car, uh, and then ultimately the GT3R, so that's just how race cars felt to me. Um, I find the Mercedes platform, the front engine platform, just inherently more comfortable, more navigable. That cushion, that window, uh, where you're driving fast enough to be fast, which just means you have to be a little uncomfortable. Uh, and as, the, as an amateur driver in this context, that's really what this is all about. Mm -hmm. You are gonna have to go beyond where you are comfortable to be fast. And to me, this car, this platform, just, it's, it's in that sweet spot. Is it because, like, through your life you've always driven, like, front-wheel drive cars comparatively to the Porsche, which has the engine in the back, compared to an engine in the front, and the weight balance is different through corners? It, it's that weight balance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, that is the, the key issue. The, the other thing that was fascinating to navigate was on the, all the Porsches, because you don't have an engine in the front of you, your sight lines mm -hmm. are... It, they're just the way they are. There's not that much out in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, the first time I was in the Mercedes, I was like, there's like an ocean liner in front of me. And I don't know where the apex is. And I was driving around at Sebring at one of our preseason tests. And every single corner, they're on the radio. And they're like, you're a little wide on that apex. And I'm like, really? Because I feel like I'm on it. And they're like, no, no, you're like two feet over. Oh, wow. Um, and it's just because I'm used to this being here and suddenly it's out there and you have to recalibrate your brain and your eyes a little bit to, okay, that's where the right-hand side of this car is. When you drive a, a car for the first time, how long does it take for you to feel comfortable where you know that you can push that car to the limit? Is that something you find out, like you're testing today? Is that something you find out in the first hour of testing, or is that something that you're always kind of tweaking? You're always tweaking. So I'll give you a real world example. Uh, I had only been in a Mercedes AMG race car one time four years ago mm -hmm. before I put my butt in this car at testing. And we did a day of testing at Sebring, another 
day and a half of testing at Sebring and then half a day yesterday. Mm -hmm. I was more comfortable in this car every single one of those. Hmm. So it's a progression. Um, and a whole lot of probably 10, 15 hours in the sim uh, in between uh, all of that as well. So, do, do you bring the sim to the racetrack? I don't. That'd be awesome for Stappen style, <laughs> throw in the plane. Uh, but no, mine's in my basement. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a question. Like, what's your perspective on like Max? He just never stops racing. Like, he's racing on the track, off the track, at home, gaming. Like, a, it's it's amazing. B, I don't know how anyone can be that singularly focused. I mean, that's all he does. That's yeah. all he wants to do. It's all he does, whether it's the sim, the track, whatever. Um, it, there's a result. <laughs> like when you look at Max's performance, um, that is what it takes to operate at the level he's operating. In, in my case, um, not only didn't I have you know a lifetime of being a professional driver to get there, um, as Sherman pointed out, I got six kids. Uh, a family that I love and want to spend time with, uh, a company I'm running, and I'm doing this. So for me, it, it's inherently segmented. Um, well, the life balance that you exude is just, I mean, not many people can do that. I, I, I don't know if it's balance, um, because it's it's a lot. I mean, it, you know, even independent of the racing, um, uh, it's it's a lot it does force you to really focus on the thing that you were doing. Um, one of the reasons that I, I don't just love racing. Yeah. I, in the last three years, I, I really feel like I need to do this. Hmm. And, and not for the reason, not for the, okay, I want a national championship. I need to win a championship at this level. It, it's not that. I, I'm quite realistic with myself about the talent level here and what that's like. And I want to do is I want to be as good as I can be, mm -hmm. and that'll be what it's going to be. But what I get from the racing is, and you know, you see this in memes. It is true. There is like all this noise in my life all yeah. the time. Like when I'm working, there's a whole lot of people and things coming at me and talking at me and. My kids are, um, it's super busy. Yeah. When I'm in a race car, there is nothing at all but me in that race car. And um, the next corner, the next lap. When I show up at the track and it's a Thursday and work's still going on, Thursday isn't very quiet. Mm. Friday, you get to five o'clock East Coast time when my work life is going to be a whole lot quieter. And I'm like, oh, it's a race weekend. And it is like, that's it. Mm -hmm. And you go to bed on a Friday night and you get the track really early Saturday and you're practice and then qualifying and then racing. Um, it's the only thing. And there's nothing else in my life that I've ever found that is as singularly physically, emotionally, and psychologically, so all-consuming mm -hmm. that there, there is literally nothing else. And it, it's, I got two questions an amazing from uh, our fans, whatever that they wanted to know. They want to know, one, what's the hardest track you've ever been on? Two, what is your favorite track? And then... I'll remember what the third one was. <laughs> awesome. So, um, hardest track I've ever been on, uh, Coda. Like, hands down, Coda. Doesn't mean it, it, I don't love it, and it's awesome. We're doing a three-hour race there in a couple of months. I'm super pumped for it. We're going to start at 5 and run until 8, so we'll get to do it in the dark. Um, any track that's got more than 20 turns, and so many of those turns theoretically look the same hmm. and the amount of time you spend where you're like oh oh just over and over and over again there is so much going on at that track hmm. um it is really really challenging uh in terms of straight up like favorite track 
Uh, I would probably say Watkins Glen. Watkins Glen. Watkins Glen. That's a really good track. The Glen oh. is unbelievable. Uh, I've raced there a bunch. I've had success there. Uh, the weather can be crazy. I did a race there. It started raining halfway through, and by the end it was sleeting. Hmm. Half the field stacked it on the last lap because it started sleeting, and it was there was only one way not to crash. You had to back off. Um, and people were like, we are so close. It was an eight-hour endurance race. They're like, no, no, we're pushing on through. Cars are flying all over. Mm. But that track, it, there is such a rhythm to that track and so many just awesome. I, it, I like tracks that are literally rewarding. Like You're like, I know if I can have a good turn, insert name of track here, if I can have a good turn one, uh, it's like Sebring. I, I like Sebring a lot. We just tested at Sebring our next race after Sonoma's in Sebring. And yeah, it's all concrete. It's crazy bumpy. It'll mm. rattle your fillings out. There's a lot not to like about it. Turn one at Sebring, you're booking down the straightaway at a, you know, buck 40, buck 50, whatever it is. And you throw that thing into turn one, you cannot see the exit. And you have to just stand on it mid corner and be like, I think I know what that's going to look like when I come out the other side. Wow. And when it's awesome, so so is that like awesome. a blind corner? Yes. Wow. Yeah. The other oh, now I remember. That's your fitness level. Yes. How do you keep up your fitness level, and what do you have to do to maintain your fitness level to race in these type of cars? Yoga. For me, yoga was the thing that I found that was most helpful. I used to be unbelievably sore hmm. after a race weekend. I mean, like your neck and your back and your legs, you were just brutal. And didn't matter what I did from a fitness perspective, I could ride a Peloton, I could do some weights, didn't do anything. I started doing just small amounts of consistent yoga, and it was the one thing that made by far the biggest difference. Although, depending on the track, and this is a good example, uh, coming down the carousel here and out of it, the G-load is long, like mid-corner, mm -hmm. that G-load is in your neck and it stays and gets more intense all the way through the exit. So it's just a long thing. By the end of yesterday, I was like, oh yeah. like You could feel I, it. Oh, I could definitely feel it in my neck. But everything else feels good. Yeah, you look good. So yoga. You keep you, Yoga is the, is, yeah. is it though? Was it called the Bikram, the hot yoga? No, no like naked? fancy. No, oh, no okay. like don't be in a don't need a goat. There was like goat <laughs> yeah, yoga yeah. and hot yoga and wet. I'm like, you yeah, know. So I've seen this goat yoga and I don't really understand. I, I, I don't either. <laughs> but no, this is just straight up like you standing there being like ah and stretching and doing yoga. And it, do you have the like the clothes? No, I'm just wearing like regular clothes. Oh, okay. I don't need like right. a, 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 Lycra. a yoga uniform. Only fans. No, no. There's no, team, there's no team sponsored yoga. Yeah, the only fans girls have got the yoga with you. I, 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 think, I think there's a lot of yoga content on OnlyFans, actually. Well, I've never been on OnlyFans. You should check I, it out. Lots of interesting yeah. creators. Floyd May, tons of sports. Floyd Mayweather's on there now. Wait, wait. What? Yeah. There's sports on OnlyFans? Yeah. I didn't know that. Boxers, wrestlers, race cars, um, golfers, um, Nick Kyrgios. Is Wait, that what are they name? doing? The tennis guy? Doing their sport, just like I'm doing racing. They That's show all. racing on OnlyFans? I, they have content from people who are racing. Huh. Like, yeah, you can like, like, learn anything on OnlyFans. Like the tennis player, Nick, uh, what? what's his name? Nick Kyrgios. Yeah, you can is just that all kinds He's of on content there. on OnlyFans. Everything. Can be tons yeah. of comedy now. Wait, so there's, it's like YouTube? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I had no idea. But cooler. I had no idea. I thought it was only like sex. No. No. <laughs> That's the big part of it. No, there's other, everything you can ever imagine. Yeah. Oh, well, we need to get to talk about it. Yeah. So you oh, I, I got a question again about tracks. Yes. Like, what is your all time least favorite track to drive on? <sighs> it's a really good question. I'll be honest with you, there's no track that I hate. Um, if I'm at a racetrack, I, I'm generally in a super good mood. There are some tracks that, for whatever reason, you consistently, and it can be little stuff, like at VIR, Virginia International Raceway, is a beautiful track. Mm -hmm. It looks like a golf course with a racetrack drop in it. It has everything. It's got cool rhythm sections and 
elevation. I should love it. Mm -hmm. It's in my home state. Every, I have never gone to VIR and finished the weekend with a car that looked the way it did when it started. You uh, crash? Every time. So when you crash, yes. hands off the wheel? Um, if you can think about it that much, uh, and at the time too, um, but usually, it, uh, honestly, you're kind of fighting it all the way to the end, thinking you're going to save it. Even though when you look at the video later, you're like, I, I wasn't going to save that. But when you have a crash, is it more driver error, or is it have a lot to do with the arrow and the wash of the other car? Like maybe they did something, you reacted to it, the car went out of balance, and then you crashed. When you are in a race, um, a lot of those involve another driver. Um, it doesn't mean you hit the other car necessarily, but something happens that puts you in a position where you get out of control and lose it. Um, but a lot of them practice, testing, it's just straight up you. People don't understand, and another question was, they didn't understand, they always say that the driver had no control over the car, and the car took over, and there's nothing he could do. They don't really understand how that works. Could you explain the technical side of how that works? So there is a point in a lot of crashes, um, and I, I've had plenty of these, where um, there's a physics moment where the slip angle of the tires and how much, tra how much traction is available with the power you're trying to put through it, mm -hmm. you're asking the car and the tires to do something they can no longer do. And when you lose that, um, there's usually a super narrow window mm -hmm. for you to fix that. And when they talk about drivers with fast hands, sometimes you see guys, the car's totally getting away from them and snap. Snap, snap. They are like, bam, and they are back on it. Right. Um, and then there's like human people. And I, I've seen, I always, you've always spent a lot of time looking at data and looking at video, and you're like, man, I, my hands weren't that fast. Uh, and it reaches a certain point where there's no amount of anything that is going to put that car back in line. And at that, beat, at that point, just both feet in and hang on. And hang on. How is the crash, like the, the cylinder inside your car, as far as, like when you see an F1 car crash, pretty much you know the person's gonna be safe at this point in, in history. Now, is that the same thing with the kind of cars you're driving? So, racing generally is so much safer than it used to be, uh, and not just at the formula car level, but in sports car racing, mm -hmm. uh, between the in-car technology, I and mean, these are all factory built race cars, there's not like, this isn't some dude in his garage like weld in a cage, uh, so the, the engineering that they've done, the, the carbon fiber, the, the Hans devices, the helmet technology, um, it is a whole lot safer than it used to be. Mm -hmm. Even when you see what you're like, that that was a hard hit. Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Um, I had a uh, incident last year at Sebring in practice for the race, and uh, in real time, I remember thinking, "All right, I'm going to make it. Nope, I'm going to hit the wall, but it's not going to hurt that bad. I'm not going that fast." And when I hit the wall, I remember thinking, no, that actually hurt a lot. Mm. Like genuinely painful. Yeah. Like getting Do you have a yoga person or some type of, of physi, physi, what's it called? Physio? Physio. Physician? No, the physio. <laughs> you know, the, um, I, I the don't. sports physio. I, I, I don't. Um, but lots of people in motorsports um, do uh, have folks who are there to work on them at the track, which would be awesome. Get a massage. Do, the do they have that like for all the racers? Like you go to a race and like this person, no, you it, have your doctor. And... It's team and driver dependent. Okay. Okay. I've always, when I see these type of interviews, I always think that to give the person an opportunity to thank the people that got them to where they are today. So I'll, I want to take this segment to like, so you can thank all the people that have brought you to where you are. So, uh, it, there's two pieces to this. One, uh, I have a wildly supportive family. Um, I, I mean, they just are. Um, racing takes a lot of time. Uh, it just does, and especially if you're going to do it at this level, and a lot of it is time away, and my family has, 
my wife Jill has been to more racetracks than anyone I know who doesn't drive race cars. Um, she's coming out here next Friday to watch me race. She's going to Sebring and Coda and every place else. Um, it, I'm not from a racing family, mm -hmm. so it's not like, well, this is just something that we all do and it's baked in. No, this is something that like dad at like 40 was like, hey, I'm going to start doing I'm going to be a race car driver. And <laughs> a lot of people's families would have been like, no, nah, I don't think so. Or they certainly weren't going to be supportive. Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, it's super interesting to me that a lot of people, I mean, probably the most common question I get asked is, how'd you get into that and how do I get into that? And I tell them the story about, okay, I did, you know, one of the most accessible forms of motorsports, 24 Hours of Lemons, and then I did this, and then I did this. At each one of those points, mm -hmm. I went to someone who was doing that, that I knew had done more, and said, hey, how, how do I do that? So there's, all, there's every been time somebody out there. Like I, I talked about Matt yeah. Connolly. Yeah. Um, Matt Connolly, he's been professionally race car driving for, you know, 30 years. He could have been like, I don't know, dude, like, whatever. No, he was like, this is who you should talk to. And I have always found the racing community, look, it, it, it's not an easy thing to do. Mm. Racing takes a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of everything. I mean, it's just, it's hard. Um, even when you feel like you're doing everything right, things go wrong and cars break and you crash and you're like, I'm finally doing this and something happens and... I mean, you see it at the macro level with F1 drivers. Mm -hmm. You're like, man, that's a raw deal. It's a hard thing to do. Yeah. But it's actually remarkably open and accessible. It doesn't mean it's not competitive. Um, I mean, everyone here who's driving a GT4 car, they're all super nice, but they're all racing against me this year, and it, they're really competitive about it yeah. and want to win. But at every different level, I found people who were totally willing to be like, hey, I, I did this. This is what you need to do. Now, it doesn't mean that what they tell you is going to be easy. Um, it's not like, oh, yeah, you just do this and you're off to the races. But it is really accessible. And whether it was drivers or team owners and coaches and all of those folks, um, they were great. What I hear you saying is racing will make you a millionaire only if you're a billionaire. Yes. <laughs> it, it, is, uh, it is not a cheap hobby at any level. Um, I, even when I was doing it at the amateur level where literally me and four friends, I came in that we had had you know, street car converted to a race car. We were the crew. We drove the pickup truck to haul the trailer. It, it was a lot for us at the amateur level, and we were, you know, just four dads divvying up the cost. Um, it is exponential when you get beyond that. Um, every single, there's not a team here that isn't running a seven figure program. Mm. And if you were running at IMSA, um, that's a probably minimum $5 million program. Um, it's like when they talk about the jump from F4 to F3 to F2 to F1, every one of those, it's like the Richter scale, man, when they're like an 8.0 earthquake is actually way bigger than a 7. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The exact same thing is true in racing. Um, and to some degree, uh, it just is what it is. I'm not going to win the battle against the cost of racing. Uh, a lot of it's technology. Um, uh, the... Carbon fiber is way more expensive than plastic and fiberglass. And as you move into more uh, higher levels of racing, there's a whole lot more carbon. And when you race your Mercedes car, how much does that car cost? If you were just cold buying a GT4 race car, that's probably a quarter of a million dollars. And you'd have a white car with no electronics in it beyond... Uh, the basics and yeah then you have to the tires and then you have to have the parts and then you have to have the mechanics I mean there's just so much that goes into it and there's so many people supporting you when you're on the track it's not just you it's there's a whole team that an engineer the and a tire person and a fuel person and 
I mean, you see all the people that are over in that garage to run the two cars for this team and this 18-wheeler, and they're all based in Florida, and so they came out here. Wow. Um, they had to drive out. They'll be here all week. There's a huge amount of infrastructure that is required to support a race team. Huge. Um, and uh, it's funny. People often ask me car questions. Um, they'll be like, hey, what do you think about this kind of car versus this kind of car? And what they're really asking me is like an engineering question. And I'm, I always joke, I'm like, no, no, race car driver, <laughs> driver, driver. an engineer. Like, I have no idea. I, I mean, I, I may know more through osmosis than your average person in the street, but I, I have no idea. So when you give feedback, and here's, here's what a lot of people don't understand, or people want to understand, what is the difference between a good driver feedback or a guy who just gets in the car and just goes, well, you know, look at the turnaround, I don't know. So if you want to know the difference between a pro driver uh, who's like a real pro driver who's done this for a living and me, that's the easiest place to think about it. I got out of the car yesterday and the engineer came over and said, so, what do you think? And I said, uh, car feels good. Like, I literally had... Nothing. Ring your I have nothing to say. Yeah. I was like, eh, car feels great. And I thought about it afterwards. And then Matt, my co-driver, got out of the car. And he's like, okay, here's the deal. Um, there's definitely an issue here. We need to change this. And as Matt and I talked about it, um, what we ultimately came to the conclusion was, man, this car pushes a little bit everywhere, and you can never get the back end to break loose of this car. Now, mm. I don't want the back end to break loose, but there's a line between understeer and oversteer that you want to get to. This car understeers way more than it needs to, and we need to sharpen up the front end of this car a little bit. And yeah, the tail's going to get a little happier, but that'll be way faster, and that's right. what we need to do. He was able to verbalize that instantly getting out of the car. And I had to talk to him for a half an hour about, I'm like, yeah, that's interesting, because in turn eight, like, I feel like the car is really on the edge. And he, professional drivers can produce that feedback almost instantly. Mm -hmm. And I am so far behind that curve, um, just in terms of, yeah, I can drive it and be like, hmm, the car understeers in one. Um, but to really understand that, be able to provide that feedback to the engineers, um, that's why it's so great to work with pro drivers. When do you prefer a car that understeers or oversteers? What's your preference? What kind of? So, I, I would, if I had to pick, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd want a perfectly neutral car that didn't do right. either one. <laughs> um, of course. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> uh, and that's also why I'm not world champion. Um, uh, I am more comfortable with a car that understeers a little mm -hmm. than with a car that's tail happy. And part of my progression as a driver is getting more comfortable with a tail mm -hmm. that is a little more lively because it's just straight up faster. Um, you could corner faster? It, you can, being able to get back to power mm -hmm. early, even when that thing's kicking out on you, that's where the speed is. Um, whereas if it's a little mushy on the front end and I'm like, man, I can't quite get to that apex, there's nothing scary about understeer. Um, oversteer can be scary, especially when it's snappy. Mm. Um, it, predictable understeer, yeah, it's going to kick out a little bit. I'm going to stay in it. I can drive out of this in my hands. Um, so the answer is I prefer a car that understeers more than I prefer a car that oversteers, but I hate that about myself. And I'm trying to teach my brain to do the opposite. So much of what I do as a driver, it, given my background and how I got here, is these really concrete moments of forcing your body to do something that your brain doesn't want to do. There's a place on this track, uh, you come through turn four, accelerate up to the carousel, and it's flat. It is. It is flat. You start in second. You're in fourth by the end, and it is flat. The car will do it. I know the car will do it because I've seen people do it a hundred times. Mm -hmm. The first hundred times I went through that corner last year and this year, I'm like, 
it's not going to do it. Not I'm going to fly off the mountain yeah. and be a pile of ashes and yeah. sticks. I had to literally force your like, no, no, all the way down. And then the funniest part is when you look at the data, you're like, yeah, I, that was awesome. I was, no. I was flat. When, and so then, then you look at the data and Matt's like flat ish. And you're like, huh? And you're like, oh man, I, my, I would have sworn on a giant stack of Bibles. I didn't lift my foot up. So when I came out last year and I was with the guy who drives with you now, he was, he's your engineer and we were together and me was me and all the guys and he had his headset on and he was saying that like, you can do it. Trust the car, just go all the way and you wouldn't do it. And this is exactly what you're talking about. The same story you're talking about. Yeah. I remember him talking about that. that. Yeah. The flat part you're talking about. It's crazy. And then once you both believe that the car can do it. Um, I, this is the way my brain works, yeah. at least. If I, Especially if you're driving with a pro who's driving your car, and you look at his data, and you're like, well, he's not dead. And so, uh, and I, a lot of it is just learning what the car feels like, because there were times when I'd be like, oh, that feels like I'm losing it. And he's like, no, no, you're not losing it. Yeah. That's just, the understeers is starting to come in. And, you do that for a while, and you're like, okay, I understand what that feels like. Yeah, we, well, we have somebody coming in right now. Come on in. It's all right. We already we got this background noise because we're in a trailer. And there's a no, you're good, noise. man. You're sure good. Is there, there's a race team yeah, going on race while we're team, here. Yeah, there's, there's people got to do people stuff. People got to do stuff. And yeah, it's a he's working, get, working environment. It's a working environment, so when you hear some noise, and we're not going to show him when he gets naked. We're going to get naked. We're out of his race suit. But you may, may it, it's only fancy. Yeah, maybe we will show it. Yeah, maybe really. we will show it. You know, <laughs> we'll put it on there, and maybe we'll get some uh, extra money. Okay, they, look, look, they, look, I charge two ninety nine. Don't forget. How much? How much do they charge? I don't know, like two ninety nine, three five, yeah, maybe ten dollars. We'll, maybe we'll charge three ninety nine. <laughs> Watch, get up, get up. I think people will pay three ninety nine for me to put my clothes back on. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I got, I got, I got an F one related question. What's your favorite? Like, who's your favorite driver on the current? F1 grid. Anybody but Max Verstappen. I agree with that. I, uh, honestly, I just want interesting racing. I, I really don't have a favorite. If Carlos won the next 20 races in a row, I'd be like, come on. Like, I just want interesting racing. I have crazy respect for what Max has done, but I'm a fan and I'm getting up at whatever time in the morning to watch this race and I want to see a race that's super interesting. Um, I don't care what sport it is, if someone effectively always wins, it gets boring. And I want exciting race. When you, before you race, how much sim time do you do in your simulator before you get on track? It depends on the track and how much I've driven there before. Um, like, say for say for here, Sonoma. How many, I mean, how, how many times, how many times have you raced in Sonoma? Uh, this is my second time racing at Sonoma. Um, I probably did... 10 hours in the last three weeks in this sim. Now, are you so much in tune when you go to a track that you can literally close your eyes and go, okay, turn one. Okay, I'm going left and I'm doing this. Yeah. Let's steer one and turn, all right, turn two, I'm doing this, turn three. Yep. You can go through your brain Absolutely. and know the whole track yes. for one lap. Yes. Now, when you follow your line, and this is, this is what I was bringing up last week on, on our show, was like George Russell, right? His racecraft, which I, I'm a big George Russell's not really. I call him one point because I don't think he's really as great as everyone makes him out to. George Russell hater over here. I totally am, totally am, 100%. Okay, so he's following right behind Alonzo, lap after lap after lap. Now, what I noticed with like Vettel and Hamilton, and all time greats, they'll take the same line. And then, okay, the second lap, well, I'm going to move over a little bit to try to find a faster line. And the third lap, I'm going to do something different. They don't do the same line every time because they're trying to pick up more time on the track. And they never get caught in the wash. They don't get caught out like that. Those guys, here's the thing. Those guys are operating at a level of the, the margins are so small. Those guys can do an entire stint and the lap differential between their laps is like this big. Um, 
at, at this level, like, no matter who you are out here, it's just not like that. Um, and so, yeah, if you're trying to catch someone and you're pushing on them lap after lap, you're going to try and, okay, I'm going to see if I can do this and experiment a little bit over here and see if that works. I got, I got a question. Like, how difficult would it be like to be in Carlos' sign situation or going from a surgery I, two, I have no two idea weeks of how I, I got my appendix taken out when I was uh, 13. Uh, I think I missed like two weeks of uh, Herbert Hoover Middle School. Um, I, I have no idea how that dude got his appendix out and got in an F1 car and drove that race. I, I don't care. I, yes, you had the best medical treatment in the world. That is unbelievable. He, I mean, he didn't look well. He still no. looked, you know, he had abdominal surgery. I have no idea how he, how he did that. I, that was like Herculean. I don't know how Lance Stroll um, was driving an F1 car after the amount of time after he broke his wrists. Um, I, and the only thing that all that I, definitely contributes to it, like all these guys are shockingly fit to begin with which is an advantage when you're recovering from anything, but I, I have no idea how we pulled that off. That was yeah, just, just wildly impressive. superhuman performance. But at, at that level, I mean, like, how did Nicky Lauda put a helmet on um, when he was, you know, covered in burns? Taylor did the same thing. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, a lot of guys have done stuff like that where you're like, I, I don't know how people did that. The night before a race, up all night, sleep like a baby. Sleep like a baby. How do you do it? Do you, you're not well, usually pills, you're not smoking any weed. Or no, I'm not smoking any weed. Or, uh, or gummies. You know, gummies no, are really No weed, good. No, gummies. no gummies. Usually it's because um, there was practice and qualifying and you're tired. Um, when you got to pee in a car, oh. pee in your suit, or just hold it? Uh, I've never peed in my suit. Uh, I actively work to not have to pee. So it's not an issue in these races because the stints aren't long enough, but I've done endurance stuff where I, I was in the car for two and a half hours. Um, so as long as you don't have to pee when you get in, you're sweating so much, you're, you, there's no moisture in your body. Yeah. Um, How many, I'm gonna say pounds and kilos for whoever, because I, I don't really understand the kilos, but how many pounds do you lose I, per race? I, I don't know, but in like an endurance race at BIR in the summertime or at Coda, um, it's a lot. I mean, you have sweated through your Nomex underwear, your race suit, you could wring it out. Um, it's hot. On the freeway, you're driving your regular car. Sometimes do you pretend that you're in the race car? <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, I actually think driving on a racetrack makes it exponentially less likely you do stupid shit on the road. Not because you don't have the inclination to do stupid shit, but you get to, you can do all the crazy shit you want um, in an environment that it makes sense. Guy pulls up to you Although, at a red you know light in a Dodge Charger and gives you the wink. Are you racing him? And if you do, would you just dust him like nobody's business? Yeah, but ironically, it's because my daily is a Tesla Plaid, and it's the fastest car in the world. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Has anybody tried to test you in the Tesla? Oh, yeah. Really? People constantly. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, really? I'm like, dude, it's 1.9 seconds. <laughs> like, these tires only last 10,000 miles as it is. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. All day long. But, you know, it's funny. You were asking about the street stuff. When I first started racing at this level, I had to learn how to left foot brake. Mm. And I, in order to have the time to kind of rewire my brain to do it, I was like, I'm going to do it in the street, um, which was terrifying because um, it, it's actually hard to get your mind around left foot braking mm -hmm. until you've done it a bunch. You just, I had no feel. So I would pull up to a stop sign and be like, wham. wham. Uh, but now it's all good. So I've tried, I've tried this left foot brain because I did the Porsche race school in LA and there's one in, I think it's Arizona and you know, you have to do the, yeah, the you trail break. Get used to it. It's hard. It is super hard. You have to rewire your brain and then it starts to feel really natural yeah. in a race car. Yeah. Yeah. And 
if you had to pick between your favorite racer of all time as a racer yourself, who was it that you said, okay, I want to kind of adopt that type of racing style? I, I, when you watch racing, and if, if you're a big racing fan, you know that certain drivers have certain styles, and you could see it on track. What, who did you model your style after, and who did you look up to before you started racing? So I, I don't think there's anyone that... There's a bunch of drivers that I looked up to, and I'll talk about one in particular, but it, it wasn't a question of me trying to model my driving after theirs, partly because the technology is so different, it's just straight up not applicable. Um, but he was the first driver that I kind of fell in love with, uh, and it was Senna. Um, like it, and I think a lot of it is just timing-wise, how old you were when something happened. Um, and when he... Um, started taking off, I, I was like, that is the most amazing guy ever. Um, I, I didn't necessarily think he was the nicest guy, um, but what he was able to do, and he drove in, even compared to his competitors at the time, really differently. Like, you look at how that guy used to throttle, but it was really driven by the technology of the cars at the time. Mm -hmm and what that allowed him to do to keep the car spooled up. Um, I mean, you see him in the corners and you watch his throttle trace and it's literally like on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. No one else did that. No one else did that. And it wouldn't make any sense to do it now, but he was definitely the guy that I looked up to the most. Now, here's some uh, really in-depth technical crappy question that I won't know the answer that you won't to. Know. No, you will know the answer to. All right, let's hear it. Like, right now, He's filling out a form of all his race stuff. Yes, tech. What, what, what's that about? Why so is he doing that? Why the, can't he just come in, throw his stuff on the floor, and walk out the trailer and be done? So all race series have a bunch of rules as to what the car specification has to be and what the safety specification has to be, including the driver gear. And they, on a season-by-season -season basis, want to literally be like every sock underwear, undershirt, gloves, driver suit has to be certified that it meets the standard um, or you can't run it. Uh, and they will check. Uh, I was at a race last year at St. Petersburg and uh, someone from my team came up and said, hey, you have to go over to this trailer to meet with the series officials. And I said, uh, I, okay, I'll go in a few. And they were like, no, no, you have to go right now and the person's here. Um, they're going to walk with you down there. And I was like, what did I do wrong? They're like, nothing. They're going to check your gear. And when they checked my gear, like she was like, uh-huh, take off your suit, show me the tag, yeah, the certification tag on your underwear and socks, all of it. It all has this little tag on it. Um, you can see it on, the, on there on the back. And uh, yeah, they check it. Wait, they check in your underwear after, they will, they after will, a race? They don't check your... I mean, it is OnlyFans. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I just Good. want to know. So, I mean, it is. So but. everyone has to pass tech usually at the beginning of the season, and then they will spot check you, um, just like they spot check F1 cars, like when they busted uh, uh, whoever it was. It was uh, Lewis, and Lewis and it was Charles and, at, for the play. at Coda. Like, yeah. I, has that ever happened before? I'm sure it's happened it, before, it has, but right. they didn't happen. Yeah. But they didn't check them every week. You know, it's like uh, same thing with driver gear. And honestly, um, uh, the safety standard is so much higher now. I, I was looking at, uh, I think it was the 60s. I mean, guys were basically wearing loafers. I'm like, dudes wearing loafers and tube socks. Yeah. Um, it, Jim Clark and those guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they would wear <laughs> leather helmets, goggles, and just like I mean, overalls. It, so, so you don't, when you come in, there's not a like a guy who does this for you guys. Like he's literally going through every piece of equipment that he was wearing, and he has to look at the serial number and he has to put it on this piece of paper. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna show it really quickly. I'm gonna go off of myself and just show everybody that he's literally filling out this paperwork with look, everything. Look, I'm sure um, wow. that we could be like, hey. Here's all our stuff, and someone can the, from the team can do this. Um, I, honestly, they get, they got better shit to do. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, gotta you still gotta fill out the paperwork. Even F1 drivers probably have to fill out the paperwork. I don't know if they have to tech. I don't think they have to tech check their own gear. But yeah. 
you still got to do some of that stuff. Yeah, the FIA passed some stupid, like, underwear rule, like Lewis and Vettel, whenever they protested that, and then Lewis still, does he still wear jewelry while driving? Does he well, just the nose stud. That? Just the nose stud. Yeah. Yeah, he got a, a actual doctor to say that he can't actually, it's fused, it's been in there so long, it's kind of fused in, and he can't actually take it out. That That's my problem as well. I leave all my body piercing. Do you have lots of body piercing? No. I, I mean, that's why, I don't have any. this is why OnlyFans wanted you. <laughs> now, now we're getting to the true story, Alex. There are no body piercings, America. <laughs> <laughs> Not on me. When, uh, when the, when the race season is over and now you're back home with the family and it's five months until race season, are you constantly thinking about racing? Yes. When, when you got guys in the office and you're helping them out with whatever issue or, you know, you're looking through so, whatever you guys do at the Vogel I, group, you know. Look, I can day to day segment quite easily. Um, and when I'm at work and it's all good, I'm doing that. Um, when last season, by the time last season ends, um, you've already generally been working on sorting what you're going to do for the next season. So there's definitely a break over the holidays because no one's doing any racing, um, but there's still stuff going on. Um, and it's like any other sport that people do that has a season that in this case, eight, whatever months long, um, doesn't mean you're not thinking about it. Right. Uh, even when you're not doing it, um, thinking about what's going to happen next year and are you going to do it and who are you going to run with and yeah. I, love, I love throwing these uh, Speed Racer or Racer X. Do you remember Speed Racer? I, I, remember I, I do. Kids? Yeah, I, I'd go Speed Racer. Speed Racer? Yeah. I always liked Racer X. I always thought I'd be Racer X because he had that mask and you couldn't see his face. He had the X on there. I, I, I think the song pulled me over. Oh, Ghost uh, Speed Racer. Ghost Speed Racer. Yeah, that movie was really bad. Sir. That was bad. That was a that horrible was movie. Yeah, yeah, Wait, yeah, the, Speed, the Speed Racer movie? Yeah, yeah. it was not a good movie. I saw that when I was like seven or six years old. Yeah. It, was, it was bad even when I was a little kid. Yeah. Was I was horrible. like 47 and it was definitely bad. Favorite race movie? The Santa documentary. That was awesome. Uh, is, uh, that was an awesome documentary. So, I, I've seen it a bunch. Yeah. And... Uh, I think it got nominated for the best documentary that year at the Oscars, and um, it, I like everything about that movie. The soundtrack in that movie is amazing. Um, my daughter, who's 25, like two years ago, was like, uh, I, I don't know, somebody, she, she bought me some Santa memorabilia yeah. for Christmas. And we were talking about Santa, and I was like, you need to see the documentary. And she was like, oh, I've never seen that. And I was like, great, we'll watch it together. And so she and I watched it. And at the end, um, she's like, I, I didn't know that it, I was going to be crying. And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, he, he died. <laughs> it's a yeah. giant bummer. And it's he, the whole thing is, it, that's my favorite racing movie. That's one of my favorite movies of all time. What, my favorite racing movie? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, wait. I think Ford versus Ferrari is one of my like most favorite recent racing movies. Yeah, I think that's Good one of my favorite. Yeah, so I just love that whole story of the whole GT40 and Ferrari. It's a really good yeah. American story. Now, as we come to uh, a conclusion, we make this a nice round hour. When you're picking out your helmet and your livery and your colors for your helmet? Yes. Do you let your children do it? Do you do it? Does Jill does it? How, how does that work? No. Um, so uh, all of my helmets are done by a guy named Brett King. Um, Brett King is an unbelievable artist. Uh, he actually started out as a motocross racer doing his own helmets and then helmets for people and is now a really sought after motorsports um, helmet creator. Yeah, and um, I, I do a new helmet every year, um, and uh, this is the second OnlyFans season, so OnlyFans is, OnlyFans is featured prominently. Um, but the way the process is, um, uh, I talk to Brett, and we have these design meetings, and uh, I talk about things I want in the design, um, and. Then he gets all the various logo files and he'll 
talk to you about colors and um, in a broad sense, and then he'll start sketching things. Hmm. And you're like, that's awesome. I want to do that. Or what if we did this? And just play off it that way. And then um, uh, three months later, this unbelievable piece of art shows up uh, at the end. Super yeah. fun. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I really think that, great. that helmets are uh, not just this one, but in general, are an amazing art form. Uh, and uh, you look around uh, the paddock, there's usually super cool stuff. Now, in your helmet, you can hear your engineer. Yep. Now, is there something for air? Like, so when you're in, like, say, Texas, obviously, right. it's hot. Okay. Okay. So is there air that goes through your suit? Um, how does that work? How do, how do you get cool in your suit? So there's two things. There's a what's called the chill out system, which we have in this car that we haven't even plugged in for this year yet. Um, but uh, it's basically an air conditioning system um, that pumps um, cooled liquid um, through two tubes that plug into two tubes on a shirt that looks like the shirts astronauts wear under their stuff yeah. with uh, things. And it runs that cool fluid over your body the whole time and keeps you cooler. Um, you can also run a system that we don't have, but we may, depending on how it feels in the car, um, where you can get uh, that same system will drive cold air intake. Uh, you see it a lot of NASCAR guys, mm -hmm. and there's like a little mag clip, and they pop it on, and they're getting cold air pumped into the helmet. Uh, and then there's a drink tube, um, which comes into the helmet, and you can hit the button and get some cold water. If I had to pick one of the three, cold water. Cold water. Um, and then after not that, not Gatorade, not no, just water, water. Water, water. Uh, and then after that, uh, the chill out system, which really can help lower your core, and because it's hot. I, I got a question actually. What is like the coldest track you ever raced at, and what is the hottest track you ever raced? Watkins Glen is the coldest. It started sleeting. Um, uh, I did a race at uh, Summit Point in Virginia once, or West Virginia, I guess, technically, where there was snow uh, that had fallen from before, uh, and the hottest um, Coda and VIR, uh, any of the southern stuff in the summertime, um, 95 and 95% humidity. And Co Coda is probably the hottest. I, I was actually, I got out of the car after an hour race at Coda two years ago, and I, I was actually worried that I was heat stroking. I was panting uncontrollably. Just like, uh, 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 uh. I just like, uh, I was purple, really hot. Have you driven any of the LMPs or any other cars outside yes. of your classification? And tell me about that experience. I drove an LMP3 in Daytona at the Roar before the 24, uh, two years ago uh, in advance of the 24 hours of Daytona. And um, I'd never driven an LMP3 car before. I'd never driven a Daytona before. Yeah. I had zero business doing it, but I had the opportunity. And uh, it's the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. I um, feel genuinely lucky to have gotten out without hurting myself. Because of the downforce? It, it's just a totally different animal. It's all downforce. The car does about a buck 85. You're on the limiter, uh, on the banking. And I, I just... They're so fast in terms of the turning in those cars. Like you move the wheel like this much mm. and the car is just on it and hooked up and going and it's all aero downforce. And yeah, I spun through the bus stop uh, uh, at Daytona in one side, out the other. And I was on the track during practice. Uh, the hyper cars were out there. Um, like lots of cars doing more than 200 miles an hour and I remember thinking I, I could have actually like really hurt myself wow uh, so I have done it I have z zero desire to drive LMP3 cars uh, which are now outdated enough that they'd be P2 cars but I'm not doing that either wow. um, I, I'm gonna stick to sports car racing um, but yeah yeah I got a question um, have you ever like raced or ridden a racing motorcycle before? I have 
definitely ridden a motorcycle before, and I would never drive a racing motorcycle. I mean, those guys are bonkers. <laughs> yeah, because my, my dad used to race Moto America. Back, yeah, yeah. He does back in the, I, in the I 90s. I think people who ride, people who road race motorcycles are totally insane. I think people who do off-road stuff, it, it's a whole other level of danger and mayhem. I have profound respect for it. I just... I'm like, no, I'm not like trying to lay my shoulder down. Yeah, because yeah, I the, mean, the, those guys are like, I remember when it's like, oh, dude, yeah, Schwantz is like, look at, look at, look how far down on his knee he is, and now they're like, yeah, yeah, dude, he's on his shoulder. I'm like, dude's laying down his shoulder. Like, I, I don't even want any like, I don't even want to pretend I want any part of that. Like, I could watch an F1 race and be like, yeah, I, I, I don't even want to pretend. <laughs> I have a hard time watching sometimes people racing on motorcycles. Yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole different. It's yeah. a whole different. Yeah, like you were saying about how the technology with cars proves so much over the years. The bikes have stayed just as dangerous as they were thirty years ago, pretty much. Except for the gear, it's still very much the same. Yeah, you're still hanging out there in space doing. Yeah. So what's in the cards for the future as we conclude? And first, I want to thank you for giving us chance to interview and think you know the fans have been uh, kind of like well what's this going to be like because this is not formula one and i'm like he's a race car driver race car drivers are different and everybody's story is different and i want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and be in this nice trailer and come and see the cars and meet all your awesome. folks super glad you guys came take out. the time out of your day to just talk to two nerds who talk about Formula One, you know, I really appreciate it. But what's in the future for Alex Wolf? What, so, what do you aspire to do with this racing thing? I, I want to keep doing it, become a better race car driver is the answer. Uh, last year was my first year doing this stuff. Um, I feel super fortunate to get the opportunity to do it again. Uh, when I first did it, my thought was, I can't believe I'm getting to do this. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, then I was like, oh my gosh, you mean I could do it again? Awesome. And the answer is, cool, I'm going to do it again. Yeah. Uh, so really excited about this season, and uh, which kicks off next week here in Sonoma. Now, when you do your race series, can people out there watch on the internet, or is there stations yeah. they can uh, watch? Or? So the uh, SRO, GT4, and GT America races are usually broadcast on Peacock or NBC like two weeks after. Um, and then uh, if you go to gt4america.com, I think you can find all the links to watch them live as well. Well, PJ and I, America F1. Like Budget say, Carlos Sainz over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, just move out. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Alex Vogel of Old Fans Racing, Racing the Motor Sport. Mercedes AMG. Not Patronus. Not Patronus. Patronus. Only fans. Only fans. And we are truly uh, happy for Alex, and we're going to be rooting for him. And we want everybody to go to gtamerica.com. GT4America. GT4America.com. Give, give your plug, Alex. <laughs> talk, talk to the camera and tell them what, what to do. Go to gt4america.com and follow along with OnlyFans Racing in the 2024 season. And if you want to come see us in person, Sonoma's the next race. We'll see you there. Keep on racing, everybody. All right. Thanks, guys. Oh, that was awesome. Dude, Michael, you have this like awesome cameo now. Hey, look at that. In podcast. Sorry to have interrupted. No, you know what? <laughs> it makes it real. <laughs>